As we go through the season of Epiphany, we're going to be seeing different ways that Jesus revealed himself not only as God's son, but as the Savior God had promised throughout the ages. Here was the fulfillment of those promises God had made. And so if you looked on your, the cover of your service folder, or even if you look at the box in your service folder that describes the theme for today, it says, Are you from God? You can imagine, perhaps, people, as they are listening to Jesus preach and teach, asking, are you from God? Because they would have known the promises and prophecies of God from the Old Testament that said, that Savior that is coming is going to be God. God is going to send him. He will be God in human flesh. So you can imagine them asking the question, are you from God? Now, you and I, sitting some 2,000 years later, have a bit of a benefit, don't we? And so, at the very beginning, I'm going to tell you a fact from God and give you a question to consider as we look at this account of Jesus' baptism. So, the fact. Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior God promised. My guess is I am not knocking anybody's socks off with that statement. My guess is you can read that statement and say, yes, I know that. The question then becomes, as we look at Jesus' baptism, why is it important for me that Jesus was baptized? How does that fit in with the, uh, the how does the fact that Jesus is the Son of God fit in with Jesus' baptism? And why is that something I need to, be, to know and be aware of? Last night, I got to spend a little over an hour in the Chelsea Middle School gym watching some grade school basketball. The thing that I, I picked up on as I watched kids run up and down the court was the number of times after they had made a basket, after they had gotten a good rebound, after the, the, the kid had thought they had done something well, were the glances that they made towards the stands. You know why they were doing it, right? As they were running up the court, in fact, one kid even reached out his hand to get a, a, a five from his dad or his mom who, were, who was sitting in the front row. Right? They had done something well, and they wanted to see if their parents had noticed. They wanted and appreciated and, and, and longed for that approval, that, that, that mark, that look that said, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with what you did. Good job. I'm proud of you. We don't really grow out of that ever, do we? Right? As, as kids, we might look for approval from our parents or our teachers, right? If you're, it doesn't take much to, to look at, a, a, especially a young child, right, who, who brings a, a special picture home that they made at school, and they want to get that look of approval from their parents, right? And so their parents hang it on the refrigerator. Or perhaps the child makes a, a, a a piece of artwork at home and takes it to school because they want to give it to their teacher and they're looking for that, that smile, that look of approval from their teacher that says, yeah, you did a really good job. As we get older, we, look, we still look for that approval from friends, from our spouse. As children, I, I think we still look for it from our parents, even as our parents get older. We look for that approval from our bosses. And that can be a good thing, can't it? I mean, it's, in a, it's a way to encourage one another as, boy, as we see someone who's done something to say, man, you did a really good job. And, and they get that look on their face that says they appreciate the fact that you noticed and that you're happy with it. That they've done a good job. But my guess is, as you think about that approval and how much we long for it, how quickly it can also turn into something that's probably not so good. Right? If all of a sudden, and perhaps you've done it, right, you can begin to use that approval as a bit of a tool to manipulate people. Yeah, I'll be proud of you if... Or I will... Man, you... you I, I will tell you that you've done a good job as long as you do 
And suddenly we've taken that approval that can be such an encourager to people and used it in a way that, oh, that isn't that good, is it? But it's not the only way. Think of if we were to begin to use that approval in a way that that's where I began to see my own self-identity. Right? As I began to look and say, boy, what I really long for and what I think I've done well is when I have approval from others. Right? As, as long as my spouse gives me some approval and looks at me, then I'm feeling good about myself. But if all of a sudden I get a look from them that says they're not happy with me and it completely destroys me or wipes me out or begins to affect me, well, well that's not a really good way to use that approval, is it? Or if I use and, and look at that approval and that's the thing that guides all of my actions. I'm going to do this because I know people are going to be happy with me, even if it's the wrong thing. That's not right either, is it? It's not hard for our sinful nature to take that thing that most of us long for, that approval from others, and quickly turn it against us. Just think of how you feel when instead of that smile from a friend, a loved one, a parent, instead you know you've disappointed them. You've let them down. Right? And, and perhaps it's because of something that, that you did on your own. It's your own fault. You look back at your actions and you go, yep, I let them down. I, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I didn't treat them the way I knew I was supposed to. And I get that look that says, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. It's crushing, isn't it? It's quite a blow to, to do the exact opposite of what we long for. And just think of how often we do it. Right? It doesn't take long for us to come up with that list of things that we've done that have disappointed others. Hurtful words. Actions that have been less than loving. Things that, that we do and act and ways that we, we carry ourselves and what we get are disapproving glances from the people that we love the most. And it shouldn't be that surprising to us because that disapprovement and that disapproval is reflecting what's going on in our own heart. And our consciences remind us that it isn't just that person that we've disappointed. It isn't just that person that disproves of our actions, but it speaks to a far larger problem that we have and that our conscience makes us well aware of. That by our, our hurtful words, our sinful actions, it isn't just that we've hurt a relationship here on earth between another human being, whether that be a friend, a spouse, a relative, a co-worker, a child. But more importantly, that's affected our relationship with God. And our conscience tells us, not only have you disappointed someone else, God's disappointed. Right? God looks at the, the sinful thoughts and attitudes we have in our heart and our mind. He looks at the way we treat others, how we've not only disappointed them, and, and, and in seeing that, he sees sin, which fills his heart with sadness, which is disappointing to him, and which has earned for us his anger. Because the psalmist writes that he hates sin and the sinner. That's what a holy God does. He's disappointed when people rebel against him in all the different ways that we sin against him and against each other. It's the very reason why John the Baptist was out preaching, wasn't it? Because people in Jesus' day, as John the Baptist was preaching and teaching, were dealing with consciences that were screaming at them about the guilt they had in their heart, about how their words and actions had not only let down others, but ultimately had, they had let down the God who loved them. 
And so they went out to this man who was preaching out in the wilderness, and John pointed out their sin. And as John's preaching took, as they heard John's preaching, and the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts, they repented. Right? And, and John baptized them. John was telling them about this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as they, they saw their sinfulness, they, they confessed their sin, they repented of it, they told God they were sorry, and John baptized them and said, your sin is forgiven. And John could say that because he was the forerunner of the, the, the Savior who was coming, right? He was there to tell people, look, the Savior's almost here. So prepare your hearts and hear the, that word of forgiveness so that you're ready when your Savior comes. So then it must have been a bit of a surprise to John when all of a sudden one day, not only does that Savior appear, but he comes to John and wants to be baptized. Why was Jesus there? Jesus had no sin. Jesus had never once rebelled against God. Jesus had not done a single thing that was disappointing to God or that God would have disproved of or displeased God. Jesus had absolutely no reason to be there. And so, as you look at the account of this in Matthew, you see John the Baptist's surprise. John, John the Baptist basically says, why are you here? I don't need to be baptized. You don't need to be baptized by me. I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. And yet, John consents and baptizes Jesus. Why was Jesus there? The answer is rather short and simple. You. What was the job of the Savior? He came to earth to be your substitute. To do what you aren't able to do. And so Jesus goes shoulder to shoulder with sinners and he identifies with them and officially begins his his earthly ministry of being your substitute, of being your Savior. And he begins that work of taking all the times you and I have disappointed not only others, but he takes all those times we've disappointed and angered our God, and he claims them as his own. Right? He, he walks into the, the waters of the Jordan River and is baptized because that's what sinners need. They need a cleansing that washes away sin and makes them holy and perfect again in God's eyes. And as Jesus is taking all of our sins on himself, he begins that work of identifying as a sinner, as the substitute God had sent to save you and I from our sin. And as John is baptizing Jesus, right, the most amazing thing happens. Right? We, we see this, the, a dove descend from heaven. And God tells us that in that dove is, is the Holy Spirit. Right? And, and heaven is opened and God the Father speaks and he says, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, that's confirmation of the fact, isn't it? God the Father himself proclaiming, here is my Son. Here is the Son of God who has taken on flesh in order to save you. Here is your Savior. And he says, with him, I am well pleased. That's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it, in the hands of a parent? Right, to be able to tell your child, 
I'm proud of you. You've done well. I remember clearly in my head my graduation from high school. The, the ceremony was over, you know, you have the, the line of graduates and you, families are going down and congratulating the, the, their, kid, their kids, their friends' kids, whatever. And, and my dad comes up and he gives me a hug and he says, I'm proud of you. I mean, I, could, I can remember it like it was yesterday. That's powerful, isn't it? And so for God the Father to speak to his Son, with you I am well pleased. There is nothing in you that displeases me. For 30 years, Jesus had been doing exactly what he was supposed to as a Savior, living a perfect life in our place. Now that that public ministry aspect of his work was going to kick off and God the Father voices his approval and his love for his son. The opposite's also true, isn't it? You miss that approval when you've disappointed how crushing it is. Right? Then if left unchecked or unaddressed, where it quickly, quickly leads to is just despair. Right? You can probably think of, of children who have been longing for the approval of their parents and never gotten it, and it, it's soul-crushing to them. And if that's what it does here on earth, imagine what it does to a person once they've realized they aren't on a good rela- in a good place with their heavenly Father. Right? It, it's echoed in the words of the psalm, Lord, if you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? Right? I, I know my sin and it's always before me and it's crushing. Now, thankfully, the psalmist goes on, but with you, Lord, there's forgiveness. As children of God, isn't what we long for most is to hear from our Heavenly Father the words he spoke to his Son. With you, I am well pleased. And you can fill in your name. Wouldn't it be a a wonderful thing to say, Ben, with you I am well pleased. And to hear that from our Heavenly Father. And he does. Right? He, he tells us, because of my substitute, because I had one who came and lived in my place, God now looks at you and he looks at me and he says, I am well pleased. Not because of anything you've done, not because somehow you've managed to earn my approval, but instead you have someone who did it for you who lived perfectly in your place, who died to take away all the times you've disappointed and angered your God. And so now God looks at you and says, you are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. And with you, I am well pleased. You are dearly loved. Right? And... and, In essence, that's what he does at our baptism. Right? At our baptism, the pastor takes water and he he puts it on our, our head and he says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you remember the things that God does for us at our baptism? He washes away all of our sin. He takes away all of that guilt. He sees all the times we've disappointed them disappointed him and he removes it from us from us as far as the east is from the west another psalmist puts it that he, he buries it in the depths of the sea in other words it is something that is so far from us that he's able to now look at us and say with you i am well pleased at our baptism he writes his name on us and he declares you to be his dearly loved child. Washed clean in the blood of your Savior. Perfect, because you have a perfect substitute. 
he's able to look at each of you and say, I'm well pleased with you. At my baptism, Jesus is there, giving me all that is his so that I can become God's. He gives me the forgiveness he earned on the cross. He gives me the perfection he earned with a perfect life. He gives me eternal life. Right and through the gospel creates in me a, a living faith that trusts in a Savior who came for me. You and I have the, this awesome benefit of being able to look back and say, I, I can see it. Right? I, I see my Savior. I see what he's done for me. I see how his baptism is, is so important and crucial for, for me and that he identifies with me. That he's my substitute. But how would believers in John the Baptist Day have seen it? Well, we heard about it last week a little bit, right? They would have heard those prophecies when Jesus was born about being born in Bethlehem born of a virgin. But even those, right, only probably a few people would be able to see and put it together. Mary, Joseph. And there were prophecies that were yet to be fulfilled. You can think of some of those from Isaiah, right, that talk about how the Savior, God's servant, is going to come and he's going to, to heal the lame and give sight to the blind. But those were still a, a little ways off in the future. And so at his baptism, God gives us confirmation of the fact, right? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior God has sent. And in seeing Jesus as my Savior and hearing those words from my Heavenly Father gives me comfort and encouragement because there is my Savior. There is my substitute. There is the one who came and lived in my place and died for me so that my heavenly Father can look at you and me and say, I am well pleased. Amen. And the peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.